What is up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Will Cash and AK White Trash Willie, and I'll be your tour guide today. Today we are talking about the scooter fork. The scooter fork is a part of the scooter that holds your front wheel in place, goes through your deck, through your headset, and into your clamp or shim, and basically ties everything together. It's a piece of the scooter that's part of the compression system, which is something for another video, but ultimately was born by this guy right here. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Broussard. The fork is a crucial part of the scooter because it needs the ability to withstand crazy amounts of pressures and stress. You're probably thinking, but well, the deck the deck takes all the stress, the bars take all the stress. Actually, the fork is the part of the scooter that probably takes the most amount of impact out of anywhere else in your scooter because it's located right beneath your clamp, right around the weak point of the deck, right around the weak point of the bars. It's a really stressful area and a lot of scooter parts can be broken around. The name fork is often called forks, and for some reason I've never understood. It's a single piece of metal with two prongs. One piece of metal, two prongs. One piece of metal, two prongs. It's a fork, not multiple forks. If there were multiple single pieces of metal called fork, you would have forks. Or kitchen utensils. But we aren't talking about spoons and knives today. We're talking about forks. The single fork, one piece of metal, the scooter fork. Before this clever guy came onto the scene, Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Broussard, and there was other clever guys, like this guy. And this guy. Behind the boom, there's a Swiss inventor, Wim Arboter. In the 90s, he got more and more tired of having to walk to his snack bar. He said to himself, if only I had a scooter. The scooter, or human-powered land vehicle, has been around for over 100 years and has been the means for children to do crazy oh. stunts and reckless acts. Yeah! So I'm getting fined? Oh. Just the one with the stupid hair, huh? Every time. The first scooters were literally roller skates bolted to pieces of wood with some sort of a handlebar fashion to it. You would really turn by leaning in theory, so the first scooter fork kind of looked like this. Kind of like a skateboard trunk, eh? Well, you know where skateboards came from. Let's jump back to the 1930s, you know? Now, there was scooters before the 1930s, but there isn't much information about them, and the 1930s was the real first documented time of, of the scooter. Scooters first started to get popular during the 1930s as a means for kids to feel better during the Great Depression. The first scooter sold to the public was the Skippy Racer, made by Harold L. Van Doren. Look at this guy. Scooters had a hefty price tag. Believe this, folks. $4.99. Yep, scooters cost $5 back in the day. You get a bag of chips, or you get a scooter. But due to inflammation, that's equivalent to about $90 these days. But still, hey, still, having a scooter cost around $90, like, that's pretty good. I feel like kids in the Great Depression wouldn't be very depressed. I don't even know why they called it that. Shortly after was a scooter called Chief Scooting Star, and let me tell you, it's literally Scooting Star. Not Shooting Star, Scooting Star. Also, help designed by Harold L. Van Doren. Unfortunately, at this time, the Scooting Star and the Skippy Racer had handlebars and forks connected. So, like the countries of Pangaea, it took decades to split them up. Sorry, Harold, but you aren't the inventor of the scooter fork, but don't worry, you'll be around for another video. Over the next upcoming decade, scooters started to explode and many companies started to make scooters like the Radio Flyer and other scooters, but these scooters still did not have the ability to whip because the fork was attached to the bars. I, hold up, I don't understand why they didn't split the bars from the fork. At this time, it wasn't important for them to do tail ups, so really, there was, there was the full whip up for grabs and the front scoop. Those are the two tricks that you could have had a world's first on back in 1930, but unfortunately didn't. Let's go to 1978, where everyone's favorite car company took the biggest project to date. I'm telling you, it's bigger than their lawnmowers. It's bigger than their minivans. It's bigger than their IV tech. Oh yeah, folks. It was. Dun dun dun. The scooter. It's a real kick from Honda. A kick and go. Let me introduce the Honda Kick and Go scooter. The scooter was not only crazy because you had a kick bar in the back to propel you to new speeds, but also because of this guy right here. 
Yeah, that's right, you see it. The first modern looking scooter fork. Beautiful, isn't it? Kick and go from Honda. Available at your Honda. Now, we're about to take the leap. Get ready, ladies and gentlemen, because we're about to be talking about the fold-up scooter. Yes, folks, that is your grandpa. That is your grandma. That is your great aunt. That is your great uncle. We're talking about the granddaddy scooter. The fold-up scooter. The fold-up scooter was something ahead of its time. It was the scooter you could fold up but also do tricks with. But this was the first scooter that you could actually do a tail up on. So obviously, tricks got invented. The history of scooters in general is something for another day, but let's take a look at this beautiful fork. Forks like these were made by Micro, Razor, JD Bug, and thousands of other knockoff companies. Our homie Wim Oboter. Wim Oboter from Uetikon on the Lake of Zurich. And he was the inventor of the micro scooter. Well, let's fast forward to our current time right now. In September 2018, Micro no longer has a freestyle scooter team, but like he said it himself. Always keeping one step ahead. That's Wim's motto for tricky situations. He's always one step ahead of the game. Boo! for not having a scooter team anymore, but you did you did invent some pretty interesting stuff, I'm not gonna lie. Not gonna lie on that one. During the fold-up era, forks were going through new tests and tribulations that were never before seen. Because the scooters were designed for everyone, that means that they are gonna go through everything. Any situation, any little thing happening, anything you can think of. People started to do more and more tricks, causing them to ultimately break under the stress. But that didn't stop this man right here. The first ever freestyle scooter fork was invented in 2008 by a man known as Andrew Broussard. Andrew is the current owner of Proto and has accomplished many things over his life as a scooter rider. The main problem with forks at the time is that they had threads. The threads of the fork were designed to have these two large nuts screw down on them and ultimately keep everything tight. The first nut was to screw down and keep the headset tight, and the second nut was to screw down and keep make sure that the first nut stayed tight. It was kind of like a locking mechanism for the first nut. This idea worked great if you're planning on just riding around, but when tricks and impacts got thrown into the mix, it simply did not cut it. Break your forks. Now, even to this day, you can still find forks that have threads, but they're really only on completes and lower level entry scooters. The fork standard for today's era is threadless and uses something special called a compression system. 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 Very similar to a bike, it uses a bolt threaded into the inside of the fork to compress everything together, opposed to having the threads on the outside of the fork and having these nuts tightened on the outside of the fork. Having the threads on the outside of the fork creates weak points all along the outside of the fork that simply make it more vulnerable to breaking. Now the only way to solve this problem is to go threadless. The first ever threadless fork was on the Scooter Resource fork, but was quickly made by several other producers. With the invention of threadless came many vital upsides, but also several downsides. The upsides were you could use a better threadless headset, which is always a better option because they're generally higher quality and can take more strength, but also you can spin tailups at a whole new speeds. You could almost create tornadoes. Another upside was because of this invention, a new term came into the scene called dialed. And yeah, for all you little kids that love me out there. Yes, it is Jordan Lago dialed. Do you guys love Ryan Point more? Yo, yes, Jordan Lago dialed. Which basically meant that your scooter sounded like a basketball because everything was so tight. 
This was cool because having a scooter be oh, completely God. tight was almost unachievable up until this point. Having your scooter sounded like a basketball meant that all of your bolts and nuts were all tight, reassuring you that your scooter wasn't going to break out from under your feet. With the invention of the threadless fork came lots of headaches as well. Every single scooter fork around this time came with a threaded fork and compression matching that, so completely changing the central heart of the scooter didn't always go well. In order to ride a new threadless fork, you would need a new clamp, a new headset, and obviously a new fork. Suppose at the time you would buy a scooter from Walmart for, let's say, $90. Then, to improve your scooter by putting on a threadless fork, you need to spend about another $200 to make it safe. And that's keeping your whole scooter how it is, except just changing the fork, headset, and clamp. Fortunately, we live in the year 2018, where basically every single complete scooter for sale comes with a threadless fork and parts to match, so it really isn't an issue anymore. Thank goodness. Over the next upcoming years, there were some crazy things that happened to forks. At the time, the most basic compression systems were HIC, SCS, and ICS. We really don't see much ICS today, and for the most part it's faded out, but we do have new ones. The evolution of the compression system is something for another day, but I will dive into how it does affect forks. Something that came around with scooter forks right around the time that Threadless became popular was the integrated crown race. The whole point of the integrated crown race was to eliminate unnecessary pieces to the scooter and make everything just tighter in general. Most headsets still come with crown races for whatever reason your fork doesn't have an integrated one, but for the most part I would say about 90% of forks these days have an integrated crown race so it's something you don't even think about. Over the next upcoming years, forks started to get skinnier, longer, shorter, and even adapted threads again at one point. Forks started to get skinnier because of the invention of something called IHC, or Mini HIC. This was a design first really implemented by blunt scooters, but they are called Envy scooters now. The idea of the Mini HIC was based on weight. Another leap happening in scooters at the time was bars were dramatically changing. There were now oversized bars with a diameter of 1 and 3 eighths, and standard bars with a diameter of 1 and 1 fourth. So it was standard steel bars working with SCS and ICS, and oversized bars working with HIC and certain SCSs. When aluminum bars came out, they had a hard time fitting because the inside diameter was standard and the outside diameter was oversized. This meant that although the bars were oversized, they would work with anything besides SCS and ICS. Because ICS was deemed unreliable, the only option was SCS. Because of a patent on the SCS and the fact that it was so big and heavy, made designers go back to the drawing board. They thought if they made a fork skinnier, they would have the chance to make a smaller shim and the aluminum bars with a standard size diameter on the inside would be able to fit into a smaller HIC system. They did this and it turned out to be very successful, especially on completes. With making the fork skinnier, you are ultimately sacrificing material, ultimately making the fork weaker. So this is why every company did not just instantly hop on the idea, but for a out of the box, ready to go complete, it was the best option for keeping the weight down and still maintaining the dialed feeling. Forks started to change in length as well. Forks started to get longer because the head tube of the decks was getting bigger, but more interestingly, the forks were also getting shorter. Decks like the early Mad Gear deck had a very short head tube space, so instead of running unnecessary spacers or cutting your fork, they simply just made them shorter. Shorter forks these days are really hard to find and uncommon, but it's still interesting that it happened at one point in scootering history. Believe it or not, threads actually came back to aftermarket scooters. This wasn't an attempt to make a cheaper in the box solution, this was actually an attempt to make a more professional compression system. This was made by Phoenix Pro Scooters as a part of their new compression system called TLC or IHIC. Because of the time I was a kid and broke, I really didn't have the money to buy this type of compression system, so I really didn't get that much hands-on time with it. It used a bigger bar. It was like oversized oversized. It was an inch and a half compared to an inch and three eighths or an inch and a fourth. But I have a good friend named Josh Toy who told me a lot about this. So the reason that this fork had threads in it was because it had a shim that screwed to the top of the fork. Some of the shims could have a pre-drilled hole at the top of the shim for a six millimeter compression bolt that would also tighten it down similar to how HIC is. There was no clamp options for this type of compression system because the clamp was welded to the bars. There was also no bar options because they were the only bars that were big enough to fit this new internal shim was the Phoenix bars. 
You could ride pretty much any fork because it had the option to thread an, a 6mm bolt into the top, so you didn't necessarily need the threads on the fork, but in order to run everything flawlessly, you needed to have a Phoenix fork, Phoenix bars, and the Phoenix internal shim. You kind of needed everything, and if you broke your bars, you would kind of be screwed because you need to buy new bars and a new clamp. And if you grew, you'd also need to buy new bars and a new clamp because you weren't able just to buy new bars and keep your old compression system. Another problem with this compression system is that it would get stuck all of the time. Because the shim was aluminum, the steel bars would, would stick to the aluminum shim and make it really hard to pull off. It was a good idea in theory, but ultimately the whole system together was just unnecessarily heavy and you weren't really getting that much benefit out of the compression system versus a standard HIC compression system. Glad that Phoenix made the attempt to do something new and creative, and I'm curious to see if they'll ever come back. With the absolute explosion of scooters, forks started to come in all shapes and sizes. There was a new thing coming around the scooter scene called the Wide Wheel, produced by Eagle in 2015. The wide wheel was 30 millimeters wide compared to the standard 24 millimeters wide, so this meant that a new fork needed to be produced. This fork was special because it had the capability to hold wheels 30 millimeters wide, but this was just the beginning. The most recent thing that's happened to scooter forks was the introduction of something called 12 standard, implemented by Ethic. Ethic is always on the cutting edge of new scooter parts, so it really wasn't that surprising to see them do something like this. The reason that it's such a cool idea is because you have the potential to go way faster. Proto Scooters was actually the first company to have bigger bearings, although they were never released to the public. 12 standard wheels are 125mm by 30mm, made by Ethic and Urban Art. The axle is 12mm opposed to 8mm, so this means that the holes in the fork have to be much bigger. If you have the full 12 standard kit, everything will go together flawlessly, but compatibility can be kind of hard. There was also one more thing in scooter forks that happened that I forgot to mention and that was the introduction of Zero Offset. Zero Offset forks became popular because it gave you a new feel to your scooter. At the time, a lot of people were running their forks backwards, so it was a really good in-between running your forks forwards and running your forks backwards. Zero Offset was more of just a fad, and it's really uncommon these days, but it's also really cool that it still happened. Well folks, you have officially been brought up to speed about everything there is to know about scooter forks. What scooter fork do you ride? Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, I spent a lot of time onto it and actually learned a few things myself. If you guys want to follow me on Instagram, my Instagram is WhiteTrashWilly, and if you want to follow the channel's Instagram, it is UndialedTV. Make sure to keep scootering guys, and always be curious about where your parts came from. I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.